Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. If you like, you can support the podcast through Patreon for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash CanadaEHX. You can also donate directly to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking Donate. On that note, thank you to Philip Sharkey, who donated to the podcast this past weekend. And also thank you to, and I'll do my best to pronounce this, Benedictuan von Dugan Blumen Minor, Greg. I don't know if that's your whole name, or if it's a nickname, or what, but it's pretty epic. So thank you for your donation. I truly do appreciate it, and I hope I pronounced it all correctly. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D, and I'm on Instagram at Bairdo37. Before any prospectors or settlers arrived in the Quinell area during the Caribou Gold Rush, the Diné or Carrier people lived off the land around Quinell, occupying the region from the Bull Run Lakes to the Dean River. Known among themselves as the Uda Akal, which means people who travel by boat on water early in the morning. They would see the culture disrupted as fur traders started to arrive in the area in the early 19th century. Explorer Alexander Mackenzie was the first to come through the area and meet the indigenous. He had learned of the indigenous of the region from the Sekini, and he would use the term carrier in his writings about them, which is where the English name comes from. In 1808, Simon Fraser explored what is now the Fraser River, and he would name a tributary of the river after his clerk, James Maurice Quinnell. Jumping ahead a bit, in 1950, a young man named Derek Rolfe was traveling in Ontario on the train when he began speaking with another young man at the station. He told the other person he was from Quinell, British Columbia, and he would write to his parents about what happened after, stating, quote, Imagine my surprise when the other chap produced his identification card bearing the name of Kenneth Quinell and explained to me that his great-great-grandfather, James Maurice Quinell, Simon Fraser's first lieutenant on the descent of the Fraser River in 1808, after whom the town is named. End quote. Things would start off slowly, but then in 1858, gold was discovered at Hills Bar, followed by more gold strikes in 1859 and 1860. In 1861, the gold rush officially began, bringing in thousands of people who were trying to find their fortune and cared little for the damage they were doing to the area and the people who had lived there for thousands of years. A key component of this gold rush was the Caribou Wagon Road, built by Royal Engineers, bypassing more difficult routes through the Fraser Canyon. This road would cause towns to spring up, built by those who want to profit by selling to the people who were looking to find gold in the rivers. A major stop along the way to the gold fields, sitting at the confluence of the Quinell and Fraser Rivers, was the new community of Quinell. Originally called Quinell Mouth, in 1870 the name would become Quinell, Q-U-E-S-N-E-L-L-E, spelled differently from how it is now. But by 1900, the current spelling would be used. On June 25, 1861, Philip Nind, Gold Commissioner, visited the area and wrote, quote, At the mouth of the Quinell River are two stores mainly for the supply of Chinamen, a number of whom found good diggings on the Quinell River. There is tolerable pasture here where cattle are kept and butchered. A flat lying on the junction of the Fraser and Quinell Rivers has been occupied for more than a year by a Norwegian man named Danielson, who lately preempted the land and is trying to raise vegetables. End quote. That man, Charlie Danielson, would profit from his turnip crops, which allowed him to invest in a ferry across the Quinell. Using the profits from that, he would obtain a franchise for a toll bridge. Danielson had arrived in 1860 to plant his turnips, offering them for 25 cents to $1 each. He would eventually sell the entire crop for $3,000 or over $100,000 today. His crops sold so well because turnips were effective in preventing scurvy, which saved many miners' lives during those early years. From 1862 to 1886, the community was an important stopping point for stern wheelers, but still growth was quite slow for several decades. In 1863, the SS Enterprise would launch on the Fraser River, running from Soda Creek to Quinell. It was the first of 12 sternwheelers to work this section from 1863 to 1921. The lumber to build the ship was all cut by hand locally, and the boiler and engine had been brought by the wagon road from Port Douglas, 482 kilometers away. 
In October 1863, two Englishmen, Viscount Milton and Dr. Walter Cheadle, would travel on the ship and write, quote, Given use of Captain's Cabin, cigars and books, fetched out every few minutes to have a drink with someone, cocktails every five minutes and champagne lunch afterward, end quote. Unfortunately, on a journey back from Tacla during the Omneka Gold Rush in 1871, the ship was wrecked on Trimber Lake and abandoned. That would not be the end of the story, though. The original boiler now sits on display in Quinell with an information board next to it, offering a description of the history of the sternwheelers. The boiler sits right near the Quinell Fraser River footbridge, right along the Fraser River at the intersection of 97th Avenue and Front Street. In the 1860s, the Quinell Pioneer Cemetery would be created, and this cemetery exists to this day with its oldest recorded headstone dating back to May 10, 1878. You can visit Quinell today and do a walking tour of the cemetery to learn about the lives of the settlers who were buried there and who helped build Quinell into what it is today. Around the same time the cemetery was built, Quinell Forks would be established as a major supply center for the Caribou Gold Rush. It would have its heyday from 1860 to 1862 when it had 2,000 transient miners coming to and from the community, while the resident population was about 100. Unfortunately, the Caribou Wagon Road would bypass the community in 1865, and it would quickly begin to lose prominence. By the mid-1870s, most of the population had left except for a small group of Chinese miners who would come from South China. While the community is long since gone, you can still visit it, located only 20 minutes south of Quinell. There are still many restored pioneer buildings and the historic cemetery. The entire community has been restored and cleared and protected from the river, which is slowly eaten away at the banks of the ghost town. In 1866, the oldest current building in Quinell would be built. The Hudson's Bay Company building is a one and a half story log building which was constructed in the heart of the business district of the community and operated by the company for the next 54 years. The building would be renovated several times during that era. The company would close the location in 1918 and the building was sold to Charles Allison in 1920 who operated it as a drugstore and ice cream parlor. For the next several decades, the building would house an auto parts store, meat market, and more. And today, it is listed as a municipal heritage resource thanks to its deep history in the community. On May 31, 1866, Charles Morgan Blessing, who had come from Ohio to find gold, was murdered by James Berry, another prospector, who then stole his gold tie pin and a large amount of cash. Blessing's friend, Wellington Moses, was instrumental in getting Barry arrested as he fled south in the stagecoach. Barry was found guilty by Judge Matthew Begbie, known as the Hanging Judge. Barry was then hanged on August 9, 1867. Today, Blessing's grave, located west of Quinell, is now British Columbia's smallest historic site, with a marker and info sign detailing the life of Blessing and his murder. You can find this grave on Highway 26, 43 kilometers west of Quinell. By the time the 20th century rolled around and the age of the sternwheelers was dying away, there was an obvious need to get tracks laid to the community. On June 15, 1916, it was announced that the tracks for the PGE would be laid to Quinell by the end of the year, with 185 miles being put down even though the labor market was severely limited due to the First World War. Darcy Tate, Vice President of the Pacific Great Eastern Railway Company, would state, quote, Efforts will be made to carry the tracks from Clinton to Quinell this year. In view of the fact that the first installment of the loan amounting to $2 million was placed yesterday, we are placing orders for our steel for the roadway, and we expect to get to work almost immediately. End quote. I'd like to take a break away from the episode for a second to talk about ExploreNet. I spent most of my life living in rural areas in Canada, and I remember the days of dial-up internet and spotty high-speed service. For the past three years, I have been a customer of ExploreNet, and I can honestly say that it is the best rural internet I have ever had. My job as a podcaster means I spend a lot of time researching online, interviewing people over Zoom, and uploading content. Through it all, ExploreNet has provided me with excellent service. When I'm not working, I enjoy streaming content on several streaming platforms, and even doing some online gaming with a friend in Ontario. ExploreNet allows me to do all of that with ease. Right now, they offer up to 50 megabits per second on their new LTE network with unlimited data. Their service has only become faster and better since I first signed on. Today and beyond, ExploreNet is investing in building and upgrading the network at a rapid pace. ExploreNet is rural, and that is their route, and that is their focus. 
For more information about rural internet options in your area, go to explorenet.com or call 1-866-285-2253. In 1911, the Fire Bell Tower would be built to help bring some extra fire safety to the community. The first real fire department in Quinell was built in 1910 with 25 members, and they would use oil can water pails and a brass pump to fight fires. The 400-pound bell would alert the town of a fire, allowing for a fast response from the community. The bell was purchased from the Timothy Eaton Company and was located next to the town hall for a time. The bell would immediately get use when, in 1916, a terrible fire broke out at the Empress Theatre inside the Caribou Hotel. By the time the fire was out, eight buildings were lost, including two hotels and a bank. Estimates of the damage was pegged to $250,000, or $5.2 million today. Then, on March 23, 1923, a fire erupted at Cohen's Hardware Store after a bucket of tar exploded while it was being heated on a stove. The fire would destroy the hardware store, the telephone exchange, and one other building. A third terrible fire would occur on June 26, 1925, when a fire broke out at the Good Eats Cafe due to an overturned lamp. The blaze spread quickly, and within an hour, the entire block was destroyed. Unfortunately, this fire would result in two deaths, John Erickson and Jack Semister. Erickson had only moved to the area the previous day, while Semister had come to Quinell in 1884. Both men were trapped in the restaurant, and by the time they reached an open door to the back lane, their clothes had been burned off and both were badly injured and would die only hours later. Property damage was estimated to be $100,000 or $1.57 million today. Thanks to the arrival of the railroad, Quinell would be incorporated as a village in 1928, and from there, growth would continue at a faster pace for the community. On August 20th, 1928, Construction began on a small footbridge that would become an iconic part of the community. By October 13, 1928, crews were pouring concrete piers, and on January 23, 1929, Stuart Wilson was dynamiting ice as it approached the bridge work when tragedy struck. Wilson was attaching a fuse to a stick of dynamite to throw it on the huge cakes of ice on the river. A defective fuse resulted in the dynamite going off before he had a chance to throw it, which blew off his right hand and wrist and mangled his left hand. Wilson would suffer severe internal injuries, and only hours after he reached the hospital, he would tragically pass away. Only a month later, in February, Joe Rousseau was hit by timber falling off the bridge, fracturing his ribs and ankle in the process. Finally, on March 8, 1929, the bridge would open in a special ceremony, providing residents with a quick method for getting over the river. And while the bridge is no longer used for traffic, having been replaced in that regard in the 1960s, The bridge still stands to this day and is the centerpiece of Quinell's riverfront trail system. It is also the longest wood truss walking bridge in the entire world. In 1930, the Cornish water wheel was installed at Heritage Corner, where the SS Enterprise Boiler is located, as a way to honour the original miners who came to the Caribou region decades before. The wheel was the first of its type to be installed in the Caribou district in the early 1860s, and was used to pan for gold on a larger industrial scale. The wheel was dedicated by Lieutenant Governor Bruce and Premier Tolmy on June 26, 1930. It continues to sit at the site to this day, and it makes for an excellent photo opportunity. On July 19, 1958, Princess Margaret would come to Quinell for a royal visit to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the founding of the community. Her stop in the community was part of a tour of all of British Columbia, so she was only in Quinell for about 20 minutes. Boy Scouts performed a parade, while the fireman's band were in attendance as she arrived at the train station in the evening. Mayor A.V. Frazier met the princess, and they did a short tour of the town. At the baseball diamond, she was presented with a bouquet of flowers from the Girl Guides and Brownies. Then, she was back on her way, heading towards Williams Lake. On June 19, 1987, at 4 p.m., Quinell gained a new landmark when a giant steel pan was unveiled. Officially unveiled by Tourism Minister Bill Reed, the structure is the largest gold pan in the world. But that is not all you will find there. There's also the world's largest mock gold nugget in the pan, along with the world's largest shovel and pick. The gold pan itself measures at 20 feet in diameter and weighs in at 3,000 pounds. The total cost to construct the pan was $20,000 or about $41,000 today. If you want to learn more about the history of Quinell, you can visit the Quinell Museum. 
The museum features many different historical antiques from Quinnell's past. There is the fan of Alice Northcott, who came to Quinnell in 1884 to work as a school teacher. There is also the pack saddle used by Jean Catelyn, who had come to the area in the 1860s and gained a reputation as the most reliable packer in the entire province, always fulfilling his contracts. When the government sent 200 Northwest Mounted Police to the Yukon in 1898, he went with them to assist in the supply train. He would pass away in 1922 and the saddle was donated to the museum in 1960. The bell from the HMCS Quinnell is also on display, which was the first Corvette ship launched from the Victoria Machinery Depot shipyards in November of 1940. The ship would serve through the entire Second World War and the bell was given to the town. For a time, it was at the high school where it was stolen during a regional championship in 1955 by Prince George players to jinx the Quinnell players. It was then returned and found its way to the museum. If you're interested in the Titanic, there is the Mary Helen Jane Baxter vanity set. In 1912, Baxter was traveling on the Titanic with her mother, and both her mother and Baxter would survive the sinking, but her younger brother would die. Today, the vanity set is the centerpiece of a small exhibit dedicated to the Titanic in the museum. Arguably, the most famous item in the museum is Mandy the doll, which arrived in the museum in 1991 and is estimated to be 100 years old. The donor had received the doll from her grandmother and kept it in a trunk for many years as it gave her a weird and uneasy feeling. Mandy has since gained a reputation for strange circumstances in the museum. When Mandy was brought to the museum, her photo was taken. The next day, the lab was in disarray as if a child had thrown a tantrum. Another story tells of a stuffed lamb given to Mandy for company, which was found the next day on the floor outside her locked case. In 1999, Mandy would go to New York City to appear on the Montel Williams show, where Sylvia Brown stated that the doll belonged to twins who had died from polio and the grief of their mother was implanted on the doll. Other strange experiences of the doll include a visitor from Calgary trying to videotape Mandy only to find his camera didn't work. One reporter who had taken photos of Mandy was in the basement lab when he heard footsteps upstairs and there was no one up there. Many also swear that Mandy's eyes follow them. and Today, many people come just to see Mandy at the museum. The Antique Machinery Park, located in Quenelle, features many unique displays, including a fully operational blacksmith shop and sawmill, and other technology used in the area during the mid-1800s. Throughout the year, the ship and sawmill host demonstrations of the equipment on hand. And lastly, you may notice in Quenelle that the fire hydrants are painted to resemble people. You can take part in a walking tour of these hydrants, which are painted to resemble people such as Charlie Chaplin, a can-can girl, an indigenous mother, a rodeo clown, Bandit Bill Miner, Alexander McKenzie, a hockey player, a prospector, and a banker. I hope you enjoyed that episode and my look at Quinell, British Columbia. If you did, please leave a rating and review. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D, and I'm on Instagram at Bairdo37. As well, again, if you want to support the podcast, you can for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash Canada EHX. And you can donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking donate. I'd also like to thank all of my wonderful patrons, and I apologize if I get any names incorrect. Vobs, Robert Page, Richard D, Colin Johnson, Katie Caldwell, Jeff Hershey, Kyle Murray, Steve Pakin, Matthew Gartho, Lionel Romaine, Dr. Bob Turner, an anonymous patron that I truly do appreciate. Randy Hayden, Doug Campbell, Reg W, Deborah Carlson, Francis Helbling, Nick Zinri, Shannon Marshall, Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Chauve, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Rawa, Luke S, J.P. Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, and Iris Gray. Thanks. We'll see you again next time.